Well, perhaps this morning's session will be a difficult uh, act to top. I'm not sure. It was a little rough getting here. I want to call your attention this morning to a very circumscribed place in organic nature that has, I think, an implication for what's been discussed here. Uh, not in the general sense of the, some of the theories that we've heard, but in the, uh, the more particular and experiential sense. <clears throat> and that area is uh, a family of hallucinogenic drugs that are, have not been mentioned particularly, which are the tryptophan-derived hallucinogens, uh, dimethyltryptamine, psilocybin, and... Uh, a hybrid drug, which is an aboriginal drug used in the rainforests of South America called ayahuasca, which is dimethyltryptamine but made orally active by being taken in the presence of a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And the reason it seems to me appropriate to talk about these drugs in a conference devoted not only to consciousness, where its appropriateness is obvious, but devoted to quantum physics is because uh, it's my interpretation that the major quantum mechanical phenomenon that we all experience aside from life itself uh, is dream and hallucination because uh, these states, at least in the restricted sense that I'm using it, take place when the large amounts of uh, radiation of various sorts that are conveyed into the body by the senses are restricted and instead we see interior images, interior processes which are mental and uh, these things definitely arise at the quantum mechanical level uh, it's been shown by John Smythes and others that there are quantum mechanical correlates to hallucinogenesis of one, of one atom. In other words, a compound will be inactive and one atom is moved on the ring and then the compound becomes highly active. And to me, this is a, a perfect proof of the dynamic linkage at the formative level between matter quantum mechanically described and mind as experienced so far what I've said is true generally of hallucinogens and of the uh, the anesthetics that John is interested in and of other drugs and experiences as well in other words, ordeals, dieting, this sort of thing can, elusi can elicit hallucination. But what makes this tryptamine family of drugs interesting is the intensity of the hallucination and the uh, concentration in the visual cortex of the activity so that uh, there is an immense vividness to these interiorized landscapes. It is as if information was being presented three-dimensionally and fourth-dimensionally deployed as light, as surfaces which have information coded into them. And when you confront these dimensions, the the dynamic relationship that uh, is evolved is one of you relating to it, trying to decode what it is saying. And uh, this phenomenon is uh, not new. People have been talking to gods and demons for millennia. In fact, people have been talking to gods and demons for far more of human history than they have not. It is only the <laughs> conceit of post-industrial societies, science and technology that allows us to even propound some of the questions that uh, we take to be so important. For instance, the, the question of contact with extraterrestrials is uh, 
a complete red herring because it is hedged about with a number of assumptions which a moment's reflection will tell you are completely false. In other words, the search for a, a radio signal from an extraterrestrial source is probably as culture-bound an assumption as to search the galaxy for a good Italian restaurant. <laughs> That is just uh, not going to happen. And yet, this has been ruled as the means by which it is going to happen. Meanwhile, people all over the world, psychics, shaman, mystics, schizophrenics, are, their heads are filled with information. But it has been ruled a priori uh, irrelevant, incoherent, or mad only uh, that which is consensually validated through these certain instrumentalities will be accepted as a signal. The other problem is that we are actually so inundated by these signals from these other dimensions that there is a great deal of noise in the circuit. This is what I would say to John if he were here, that uh, it is no great accomplishment to hear a voice in the head. The accomplishment is to make sure that it's telling you the truth. <laughs> because uh, the demons are of many kinds. Some are made of ions, some of mind. The ones of ketamine, you'll find, stutter often and are blind. All right. And of all the others, I might say as well, it is not that you kneel in genuflection before a god because you will be like Dorothy before Oz. There is no dignity in the universe unless you meet these things uh, on your feet. And that means that you have an I-thou relationship and you say, okay, well, you say you're omniscient, omnipresent, or you say you're from Zeta Reticuli, or you say, you say you're long on talk, but what can you show me? And uh, magicians, people who invoke these things, have always understood that you go into it with your wits about you. Well, what does it, all this have to do with this family of drugs that I was talking about? Simply this, that this family of drugs has been overlooked. Whenever you, psilocybin is the one that most people have some experience with. Psilocybin legally and uh, in people's assumptions about it is lumped with LSD. They say psilocybin, LSD, masculine, da 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 da. It is, um, each one of these things is a phenomenologically defined universe unto itself. And, uh, Psilocybin and DMT, although DMT is more intense and briefer in its action, these things invoke the logos, which means they work directly on the language centers so that the important uh, aspect of the experience is the dialogue. And as soon as you discover this about psilocybin, about tryptamines, you have to decide whether or not to enter into the dialogue to try and make sense of the incoming signal. And uh, this is what I've done. I don't call myself a scientist. I call myself an explorer because the area that I'm looking at, there is not enough data to dream of a science. We're at the stage where people map one river and indicate other rivers flowed into it, but they didn't ascend those rivers, and so nothing is known about that. And this Baconian collecting of data with no assumptions about what it has yielded, what it will yield, has pushed me to a number of conclusions that uh, I didn't anticipate. I uh, maybe by chronologically going through it, I can explain to you what I mean. And describing these trips raises all of the issues. I first took DMT in 1965, and a friend of mine came to me with this substance. How many of you have smoked DMT? It's by injection. By injection. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's surprising so few have. 
because we live in a society that is absolutely obsessed with sensation. Every kind of thing you can imagine, every therapy, every drug, every sexual configuration, all forms of media overload, all of these things are adored in this society. And yet here is something that actually uh, hedonists that we are, pursuers of the bizarre that we are, this thing uh, is too much. Or at least, as they say in Spanish, bastante. It's enough, <laughs> so much enough that it's too much. Um, you smoke it, and it comes on in about 15 seconds. You essentially fall back unconscious. Your eyes are closed, and you hear a sound like ripping cellophane, like someone crumbling up. Uh, saran wrap or something like that and throwing it away. A friend of mine says this is your radio entelechy ripping out of the organic matrix. Mm. And you hear a tone, one of these ascending this kind of thing. And then there is the normal hallucinogenic drug modality which is a shifting geometric surface of migrating and uh, changing colored forms. And then th you come up against this. It's like the, <clears throat> well, there must be some analogy in the, at the site of activity. All the bond sites are being occupied, and you're actually seeing the state begin to come into being over a period of about 30 seconds. And then you are in a place which is... Uh, well, I haven't taken all drugs. I think if someone tells you they've taken every drug, you know they're confessing they're a dilettante. It's uh, much better to lean hard on a few. But I've taken most of the ones that would reflect or give uh, uh, a measure against this experience. And you find yourself in a space. Uh, it has a feeling of being underground or somehow insulated and domed. It's what in Finnegan's Wake is called the merry-go-round from the German word Raum for space. And you actually, the room is going around. And in that space, you feel, and Amit brushed this this morning, you feel like a child. You feel that you have come out somewhere in eternity. And it always reminds me of the 53rd uh, fragment of Heraclitus, which is the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. And you not only become the aeon at play with colored balls, but there are entities which are, in my book, The Invisible Landscape, I describe them as uh, self-transforming machine elves. But, and this is sort of what they are. They're um, dynamically contorting topological modules that are somehow distinct from the surrounding background, which is itself undergoing this continuous transformation. They all, I always think of the scene in um, The Wizard of Oz after the house knocks the witch down and she's in Munchkin land and the head of the munchkins comes with a scroll and they all have very squeaky voices and they sing a little song about <laughs> you are absolutely and completely dead <laughs> and they're marching around her <laughs> so the munchkins come these hyperdimensional machine elf entities and they bathe you in uh, love which is spelled l-u-v it's a kind of, um, well, it's not erotic and it's not heartful, but it sure feels good. <laughs> <laughs> and what they are saying is, don't be alarmed, remember, and do what we are doing. Now, another, and one of the interesting characteristics of DMT, and another reason that I would prefer it over something like ketamine, with ketamine, you are not afraid. You go unafraid. I think one of the interesting things about judging a drug is to see how eager people are to do it the second time. If they're eager to do it the second time, it's probably not worth bothering about because what is necessary to have 
validity in these experiences is uh, the terror. The terror is the stamp of validity on the experience because it means, you know, this is real. We are in the balance and uh, in these states with these tryptamine drugs, we read the literature, we know what the maximum doses are, the LD50, this and that, but so great is one's faith in mind that when you are out there, you know that the rules of pharmacology do not really apply and that control of existence on the plane is a matter of decision and luck and the roll of the dice. With ketamine, you don't get this. Uh, so they are reassuring you, these little entities, and saying, don't worry, don't worry, do this, look at this. Meanwhile, uh, you are completely there. Your ego is intact, your fear reflexes are intact, you are not fuzzed out at all, and consequently <coughs> your reaction is this. You know, and it persists, and it persists, and you breathe, and it persists, and they're saying, you know, don't, don't get some loop of wonder going that quenches your ability to understand. Just try not to be so amazed. Try to hang in and look at what we're doing. And what they're doing is um, emitting sounds like music, like language, and these sounds uh, pass as Philo Judeus said that the Logos would, when it became perfect, pass from being heard without ever going over a quantized uh, moment of distinction into things beheld. And so what you, you hear and behold a language of alien meaning which is taking place right in front of you and it is conveying alien uh, information which cannot be Englished. Now being a monkey there is a, there is a, a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance that is set up in your hind brain when you encounter an unenglishable object because you try to pour mind over it and it just sheds it like water off a duck's back and then you try again and you are looking at it and this cognitive dissonance, this wow or flutter that is building off this object uh, causes wonder or awe, awe at the brink of terror. So you have to keep controlling that and the way to control it is to do what they're telling you to do, which is do what we are doing and then you begin to experiment with your voice. And uh, I've uh, a phenomenon is possible. And uh, by the way, I give this lecture in this way to invite the, expen the attention of experimentalists, whether they be shaman or laboratory people or tank people or whatever, because I'm telling you there's something going on in this, uh, with these drugs that is uh, not part of the normal spectrum of hallucinogenic drug experience as it's uh, known to be. So you begin, you begin um, this glossolalia-like phenomenon, although it isn't classical glossolalia which has been studied. In classical glossolalia, pools of saliva 18 inches across have been measured on the floors of these South American churches after these, uh, where people have been kneeling. And people always ask after the glossolalia has happened, they turn to the people next to them and say, did I do it? Did I do it? Did I speak in tongues? This isn't like that. This is simply a brain state which allows a, either the assembly language which lies behind language or a primal language of the sort that Robert Graves was talking about in The White Goddess or a, a Kabbalistic language of the sort that is described in the Zohar, a primitive, primal, proto ursprach that comes out of you and you discover you can make the extraterrestrial objects, the feeling-toned, meaning-toned, three-dimensional, rotating complexes of light and color and transformation. And you feel like a child 
and you are playing with colored balls. You have become the aeon. So this happened to me 20 seconds after I did this drug uh, on this day in 1965. And I was uh, appalled. <laughs> I mean, I thought that I had my ontological categories intact and I had taken LSD and it just it was all going forward. And this thing came upon me like a bolt from the blue and I came down and I said, and I said it many times while I was coming down, I cannot believe it. This is impossible. This is completely impossible. Because it was not, you know, that I was kneeling at the feet of some Rishi or Roshi or Geshe or one of those guys. It was not that it was, there was a declension of Gnosis. It was that Friends, right here and now, one quanta away, there is raging a universe of active uh, intelligence that is transhuman, hyperdimensional, and extremely alien. The god that John Lilly talks to, that they play these games with about moral values and setting the constraints of the universe, is not like this god at all. The chief thing about the god of tryptamine, if, if we can use that, I call it the logos, that's what I think it is, and I make no judgments about it. I constantly engage it in dialogue, saying, you know, well, what are you? Are you some kind of diffuse consciousness which is in the ecosystem of the earth? Are you... Uh, and the problem with it is that it is just full of answers to these questions, <laughs> you know? It's, it, it's the, the true history of the galaxy over the last four and a half billion years is uh, trivial to it. And it can show you, you know, you can tune these images. And of course, the question always is independent validation, or at least for a time for me, the question was. But as I attended more and more conferences like this and realized that the structure of the Western intellectual enterprise is so flimsy at the center <laughs> that apparently no one knows anything, I became less... Uh, reluctant to talk about these experiences because they are experiences. Uh, they are primary datum for being. It is, uh, this is uh, not remote and yet it is so unspeakably bizarre that it casts into doubt all of man's historical assumptions and any of you who are familiar with the books I've written, I've entertained various ideas about it. When we first discovered the mushroom in South America, and uh, it does these same things that DMT does, al although it builds up over an hour and is sustained for a couple of hours and then <coughs> comes down. But there is the same confrontation with an alien intelligence and... Um, these extremely bizarre, un-Englishable information complexes and the hint, the hint that's, that these drugs suggest that there is something that you can do with your body that you have never done, that no one has ever done, and that yet once it is done, it will be so obvious that it will fall uh, right into the mainstream of cultural evolution. And I suggest that uh, language either is the shadow of what I'm talking about or that what I'm talking about is a further extension of language. Perhaps, uh, you know, I mean, perhaps a language, a human language is possible where there are actually the intent of meaning is beheld in three-dimensional space. If this can happen on DMT, it means it is at least, under some circumstances, accessible to human beings. Well, given 10,000 years and a high-pressure technology looking at that, does anyone doubt for a moment that it could become uh, just a cultural convenience in the same way that mathematics has become a cultural convenience or language has become a cultural convenience? But anyway, in confrontation with this 
organized into Lecky on the other side, I, many theories were elaborated. Uh, the theory that we wrote about in the book on psilocybin that teaches you how to grow it was uh, that it was in fact an extraterrestrial, that in fact the physical body of the mushroom was the flesh of a species that did not evolve on Earth. That, uh, and it, it, it said this, it had a whole rap. It said, yes, well, once a culture takes control of its, has complete understanding of its genetic uh, information, it re-engineers itself for survival. And our version of that <coughs> is a mycelial network strategy when in contact with a planetary surface and a spore dispersion strategy uh, in terms of as a means of, of radiating throughout the galaxy. And uh, though I am troubled with how freely Bell's non-locality theorem is thrown around, nevertheless, my friends on the other side do seem to be in possession of a huge body of information drawn from the history of the galaxy. And they say that there is nothing unusual about this, that man's conceptions of uh, organized intelligence and the dispersion of life in the galaxy and this sort of thing are just hopelessly culture-bound, and that the galaxy has been a, uh, an organized system for billions of years and that and that life evolves under so many different regimens of temperature and pressure that uh, searching for an extraterrestrial who will sit down and have a conversation with you is like searching for a good Italian restaurant out in the galaxy. The main problem with extraterrestrials is to recognize them because time is so vast and evolutionary strategies so varied and environments so varied that uh, the trick is to know that contact is being made at all. The mushroom, uh, if you can believe what it says in one of its moods, is a symbiote and it desires symbiosis with the human species. It achieved it early uh, by associating itself with the domesticated cattle that people keep. In other words, like the plants man grows and the animals he uh, husbands, the mushroom sought to inculcate it in itself into that family because it's very clear that where human genes go, those genes will be carried. It's the old develop uh, burrs so you can attach yourself to the fur of an animal and it will carry you with it wherever it goes. The mushroom, by being domesticated by human beings, has become a part of the human family. But this is all just beginning. In speaking for a moment in terms of the classic mushroom cults uh, in Mexico, they were destroyed by the coming of the conquest. The, the Franciscans had an absolute monopoly on theophagia, which is eating God. And when they came upon these people, calling a mushroom Tiananacatl, the flesh of the gods, they set to work with the Inquisition and were able to push this thing into the mountains of Oaxaca so that it only survived in a few villages until Valentina and Gordon Wasson went in the 1950s and found it there. And I, the metaphor I like uh, for that Another metaphor, you see, you balance these explanations. Now I'm going to sound like I don't think it's an extraterrestrial. It may be, it may not be. It may be what I've come recently to suspect is that the human soul is so alienated from us in our present culture that uh, we treat it as an extraterrestrial. The most alien thing in the cosmos is uh, the human soul. That's why these movies like E.T. or even Alien, uh, those guys could come tomorrow and uh, the DMT trance is weirder and holds more promise for, uh, for information for the human future. 
uh, it is it is that intense a kind of thing. But what I was saying was, um, they burned the mushroom cult. They forced it into repression. They burned the libraries of Greece at an earlier period. They dispersed the ancient knowledge. They shattered the stellar and astrological machinery that had been built. And by they, I mean the Greco-Hellenistic Christian Judaic tradition. And they built a triumph of mechanism. They realized the alchemical dreams of the 15th and 16th century and the 20th century with the transformation of elements, the discovery of uh, gene transplant, and this kind of thing. But then, having conquered the new world, having driven its people into cultural fragmentation and diaspora, in the mountains of Mexico, they came upon the, the body of Osiris, the condensed body of Eros, where it had retreated at the coming of the Christos. And this thing is now unleashed. If any of you read uh, Phil K. Dick's, one of his last novels, Valus, where he talks about, uh, about the Logos, how it went into the ground. It was a creature of pure information, and it went into the ground at Nag Hammadi, at the burying of the Chenoboskian Library in 270. But it was information, and it existed there until 1947. And then the texts were translated. People read them, and as soon as people had the information in their minds, the symbiote came alive, because it is a thing of pure information. And this is the same sort of thing. The mushroom consciousness is the consciousness of the other, both in hyperspace, which means in dream and in the drug trance, at the quantum foundation of being, and in the human future and after death. And all of these places, which were thought to be discrete and separate parts, are seen to be part of a single continuum. The, what history is, is the dash over 10 to 15,000 years from monkeyhood to flying saucer without ripping the envelope of the species so badly that the birth, that the birth is aborted and, uh, and uh, fails and we remain in physes. And uh, history, essentially, then, is the shockwave of eschatology. Something is at the end of time, and it is casting an enormous shadow over human becoming, and it is drawing all human becoming toward it, so that all the wars of history, the philosophies, the rapes, the pillaging, the migrations, the cities, the civilizations, all of this is occupying a microsecond of geological, planetary, and uh, galactic time as the monkeys react to the symbiote which is in the environment, which is feeding the information from the true about the historical situation in the galaxy. And it is not... <clears throat> I don't belong to the school of people who say, well, we couldn't have done it if they hadn't taught us writing and that sort of thing. This, they came from the stars and taught us to measure rap. What I'm saying is, I hope, something much more profound than that. It's that as nervous systems evolve to higher and higher levels, they become more and more to understand the true situation in which they are embedded. And the true situation in which we are embedded is an organism, an organization of active intelligence that is on a galactic scale. And uh, science may be culture-bound, mathematics may be culture-bound. People can argue about these things, but no one knows because we have never dealt with an alien mathematics or an alien culture except in this limited area that is ruled out of bounds by the guardians of the truth. In other words, shamanic experience, drug experience, this is ruled out of bounds, and it is because it is the source of novelty, the cutting edge of the ingression of the novel into the plenum of being 
is happening there. I mean, think about it for a moment. If the human mind does not loom large in the history, in the coming history of the human race, then what is to become of us? Uh, the people who worry about getting the epistemological and ontological bases of these things nailed down say that the mathematics is in good order. What the problem is, is that the mathematics does not map well into English or any other natural language. And so people have violent disagreements in English when they are completely in agreement over the mathematical foundation of it. So I am saying uh, we are at the beginning of human thought. This is uh, the birth crisis of intelligence. And intelligence is something which is moving through the higher primates now at greater and greater speed. We know that there were primate species that were not human that chipped tools and made fire and drilled beads. So uh, the question, are we unique, it has already been answered by the physical anthropologists. Uh, there have been other intelligent monkeys walking this planet. We exterminated them, and so now we are unique. But uh, what is loose on this planet is language, self-replicating information systems. Uh, it may be a further rarification or a further hypostatization of what is happening in DNA, in other words, learning, coding, templating, recoding, testing, retesting, recoding. It may be, and the immune system does that too, it may be an extension of that or it may be a quality of an entirely different order. But whatever it is, it is in the monkeys now and moving through them and moving out their hands and into the techni with which we have surrounded ourselves. The end state that this pushes toward and the, and the tryptamine state seems to me to be in that sense transtemporal. It is an anticipation of the future. It's, it's <clears throat> as though uh, Plato's metaphor were true. Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. The tryptamine state is as though you step out of the moving image and into eternity, into the nunc stands, the standing now, the standing waveform of Thomas Aquinas and, and in the modern parlance of holographic transforms. Uh, and in that state, then, all of human history is seen to lead toward this culminating moment. And I take the acceleration that we see in the processes around us, the fact that fire 50,000 years ago or whatever it was, language 35,000, whatever, then measurement 5,000, then Galileo 400, then Heisenberg. And what is obviously happening is that everything is being drawn together. The description our physicists are giving us of the universe, which is that it lasted billions of years, will last billions of years, is a dualistic conception, a, an inductive projection that is very unsophisticated when it comes to the nature of consciousness and uh, language. What Ahmet has gotten at in this conference, that, that, the, that consciousness collapses the state vector and causes the stuff to undergo what Whitehead called the formality of actually occurring, is the beginning of the understanding of the centrality of man. We have been on a decentralizing bender for 500 years, getting, saying that, you know, no, the earth is not the center of the universe, man is not the beloved of God, moving ourselves out toward the edge of the galaxy. The fact is that the densest organizational material in the universe is the human cortex. And the densest uh, and richest experience in the, hu in the universe is the experience you're having right now. Everything in the cosmos should be constellated outward from the perceiving self. 
That is the primary datum. And the perceiving self, under the influence of these drugs, gives information that uh, is totally at variance with the models that we inherit in this society. So what I'm saying is, uh, first of all, that this dimension exists. Second of all, on one level, it ain't no big deal. People have been into this for millennia. It's just that we are so grotesquely alienated and taken out of what life is about that to us it comes as a revelation because uh, the closest we can get to it is to try and feel in some dilettante-esque mode uh, the power of myth or something, you know, and it's this grasping after and it's very over-intellectualized sort of process. Well, <coughs> <laughs> I see it's noon. Uh, they say if you don't strike oil in half an hour, you should stop boring. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if there's anything to sum up about this. I think you struck it in half a minute. Whoa. <laughs> the, two things, the two things that I want to leave you with is, first of all, uh, always in these kind of discussions where you present yourself as an explorer and not a scientist, yada, yada, it's always that uh, testimonials are what's being given. I do not believe that I am unique. Because if I believed that I were unique, none of my conclusions would have any meaning because they would be uh, of worth only to me. So everything I've described this morning has got to be more or less a part of the human condition. Meaning, of course, maybe I have some facility for it, maybe somebody else, it's very difficult to achieve. But it is, uh, it is part of the human condition. When I first smoked the DMT, I was an art history major. And I have a very, uh, you know, thorough, for a non-professional, thorough knowledge of art history and, and religious art in particular. And what blew me away was that there is nothing, and I was a union very much into that, and there was no clue, no clue, that these places exist. And I could not understand that. I said, well, you know, surely art is about carrying images out of the other, from the logos to the world, drawing ideas down into matter. Why is <coughs> art, human art history so devoid of what I experienced so totally? And uh, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, the alienness is very important. And I think, uh, I haven't spoken at all today about flying saucers, or, or only by implication, but this is a favorite subject of mine, because I think the, the flying saucer is the central motif to be understood in order to get a handle on reality here and now. We are alienated, so alienated, <clears throat> that the self appears to, it must disguise itself as an extraterrestrial in order to not alarm us with the truly bizarre dimensions that it encompasses. And if any of you saw the movie E.T., the whole point of that movie was for to get the kid and the audience and everybody jacked around to the place where the kid, with tears of joy streaming down his face, could look out into the cool of the purple evening and say, E.T., I love you. And uh, this is a great thing. It is a healing of the... Uh, psychic discontinuity that we have been on since at least the 16th century, possibly earlier. Uh, the testimony that I want to give today is that uh, magic is alive in hyperspace and you don't have to believe me or follow me or uh, do anything <laughs> to validate that except form a relationship with these uh, plant drugs and uh, 
that's the first time I think I've used the word plant. But that, for me, is the defining characteristic. Remember my little ditty about the demons that are of many kinds, made of ions, made of mind. There is some surety that you are dealing with a creature of integrity if you deal with a plant. But the creatures born in the demonic artifice of laboratories have to be dealt with very, very carefully. And uh, I think I'll just leave it right there. If Here's anybody... You, you might want to mention that uh, DMT is manufactured in the human brain, but yes. in sub-threshold doses. I could have talked about all of that, that DMT is an endogenous hallucinogen, that psilocybin is 4-phosphoryloxy nn dimethyltryptamine that serotonin, which is the major neurotransmitter running your brain found in all life, found most in man, is 5-hydroxytryptamine. The very fact that you can smoke DMT, and I don't know if I mentioned, but it takes five minutes. You do it, it comes on in 45 seconds, it lasts three minutes, you come down in two, that's it. The very fact that that can happen means that your brain is absolutely at home with this compound. It just says, oh, I know what this is. I know how to de-alkylate, de-animate, <laughs> you know, and it does it. Where a drug like LSD, it clings, it hangs around. <laughs> Ketamine as well. Ketamine as well. And, I, my, and if I could say one more thing, just a cautionary note, because I always feel odd telling people, you know, verify this thing, it's out there, and the means is the drug. Uh, people should be very careful. I said earlier in this talk that I was addressing experimentalists, psychologists, psychiatrists. I don't mean to scare anyone off, but you should build up to it. These are bizarre dimensions of extraordinary power and beauty. And uh, I don't believe there's any set rule for acquiring power to not be overwhelmed. But I think moving carefully, reflecting a great deal, always trying to map it back on the history of the race and the philosophical and religious accomplishments of the species. This should always be done. Uh, I, if John were here, I would uh, get a debate going with him. Uh, all drugs are dangerous. All drugs uh, at sufficient doses or repeated over a sufficient amount of time, uh, there are risks. The possibility of kindling epileptic effects is well known in ketamine. There's a stack of literature on that. If anybody is intending to do ketamine who hasn't done it, the first place you go when you're going to take a new drug is the library. You know, read through, you know, all this stuff. Yeah, Terence, uh, can I ask you um, a couple of questions? That sure. Are most intriguing to me. Um, well, one comment. Uh, there is in the Oriental art history uh, some, if not a tremendous amount, of information of these demonic aspects, uh, both from experimenting with drugs, which are very common in religious sects all over India, China, all of these ancient countries. Drugs were always used, plant drugs, of course. They didn't have laboratory. Uh, they, they actually did, uh, some. But uh, in the uh, Zen traditions, also, there is the unmistakable uh, uh, evidence of encountering these demons. And they are talked about in various ways. In the Enlightenment experience of the Buddha, it was the uh, uh, confronting the Mara, the god of death which sounds very similar to the terror experience that, uh, that you talk about. In retrospect, we are beginning to understand that all of these experiences must occur because something similar happened in the religious experience and this drug experience. In fact, these drug experiences have been extremely valuable in telling us about many of the other experiences that we find in the esoteric literature. Uh, the comment that interested me most is that you said that the terror in the drug experience is very essential and it is better to use the aspect of terror as knowing that you are into the real thing than drugs which give into these pleasure trips uh, where you are never sure. 
And what is your question? That that is the question. Could you elucidate this a little bit? Why do you talk think about that way? the terror? Or talk about the terror and also why do you think well, that uh, the, it, that switch to uh, otherwise? I'm not saying that there is something intrinsically good about terror. I'm saying that granted the situation, if you are not terrified, then you must be uh, somewhat un in contact with the full dynamics of the situation. To not be terrified means either you're a fool <laughs> or uh, you have taken a drug which paralyzes the ability to be terrified. I have nothing against, uh, you know, hedonic experience, and I certainly bring something out of it. But the what you it must, you know, it must move your heart, and it will not move your heart unless it deals with the issues of life and death. And if it deals with the issues of life and death, it will move you to fear, it will also move you to tears, it will also move you to laughter. But uh, these places are profoundly strange and alien and uh, I, I agree with you and I disagree with you about the art thing. I mean, I, I've been to Kajuraho and I've uh, been to Bhubaneswar and I'm fairly familiar with that art, collected tonkas, all these things. And I did see similarities in my LSD experiences. In fact, uh, it was LSD experiences that drove me to collect uh, uh, Vajrayanist art. But what amazed me was the total absence of the motifs of DMT. It is not there. It is not there in the funerary art of Egypt. It is, well, I mean, there are certain, there's a story, a very interesting story by uh, Jorge Luis Borges called uh, The Sect of the Phoenix. Yeah. Do any of you know that story? No. It takes a page and a half. And he starts out and he says, there is a sect and it touches all mankind. Its practitioners have been the victims of persecution in every war in history. Its practitioners have held the red-hot poker at every inquisition in history. It is, touches the wealthy, it touches the poor. It respects no language barrier, it respects no age, no nothing. And it involves a right and the practitioners of the sect view the rite as trivial. It may be done in doorways. It is propitiatous to do it at the waxing of the moon. It involves something orange. It is old. The practitioners never speak of their cult, and when they do, they <coughs> refer to it as the secret. And this and he goes on and he traces it to the gypsies, and, but he, and he never explicitly says what it is. But I think if you know his other story, the Aleph, you put these two together and the Aleph is the subject of the cult of the secret. And I don't know, uh, the mushroom said, and I'm sure you'll be horrified at this, <laughs> the mushroom said to me in the Amazon when they were revealing all this information and, and deputizing us to do all these things, that we said, why us? Why should we be, you know, the ambassador of an alien species into human culture? And they said, because you have never believed anybody because you have never uh, given over uh, your belief to anyone, and this is somehow necessary. So I, uh, the sect of the phoenix, the cult of this experience, is perhaps millennia old, but it has not yet been brought to light where the threads may run. The drug, uh, the history of drug taking on this planet is fairly well understood. Mushroom taking was confined to the central isthmus of Mexico 
supposedly the kind of mushrooms I'm talking about, not Amanita muscaria, which is a different issue and a different compound. But psilocybin was restricted to central Mexico until the Spanish conquest. The Strophoria cubensis, which is the mushroom we wrote our book about, has not, is not known to be inculcated into a shamanic rite anywhere in the world. DMT is used in the Amazon and has been for millennia, but by cultures so primitive, not, I mean, the most primitive cultures use these DMT drugs. The Amazon is a world where you go nowhere except on, a, on water. Rivers are everything. Yet there are people who have not, who shun boats, don't build them, don't have them, think it's a passing thing, not here to stay. <laughs> and they are in to these hallucinogens. I am baffled, and I am baffled by what I call uh, the black hole effect, which seems to surround DMT. You know, a black hole uh, is a curvature of space such that not only light can't leave it, but no signal can leave it. Therefore, no information can leave it. And uh, whether this is true in practice of spinning black holes and yada yada, but as a metaphor, think of it that way. DMT is like an intellectual black hole in that once you know about it, it's very hard to, for anyone to understand you when you're talking about it. <laughs> they don't hear you. And the more you are able to articulate what it is, the less they are able to understand. <laughs> and this is why I think uh, people who are enlightened, if we may for a moment co-map these two things, are silent. <laughs> They're silent because you can't understand them. <laughs> and uh, why this thing has not been looked at by scientists, by thrill seekers, uh, by anybody, I am not sure. But I recommend it to your attention. And uh, I believe we didn't even touch on uh, the human future that the psychedelic state implies. But the future is bound to be psychedelic because the future belongs to the mind. And we are just beginning to push the buttons on the mind. And once we tr take a serious engineering approach to this, we are going to discover, you know, the plasticity, the mutability, the eternality, uh, of the mind and I believe release it from the monkey. My vision of the final human future is that what history is about in engineering terms is an effort to uh, exteriorize the soul and in interiorize the body so that the exterior soul exists as a uh, superconducting lens of translinguistic matter generated out of the forehead of each of us at a critical juncture, our, our psychedelic bar mitzvah, as it were. <laughs> and that from that point on, you are eternal. And somewhere in the solid state matrix of the translinguistic lens that you have become, your body image exists as a holographic wave transform and you are at play in the fields of the Lord. You live in Elysium, uh, Versailles in the morning and... Uh, <laughs> so that's it. That's it. We have, uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we have not been stopping at 12.20 every day, so I'll oh, go okay. on. I'd like to ask you a question, but I'd like to... Experience. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> I, I think that the tragedy of our cultural situation is that we have no shamanic tradition. Shamanism is primarily techniques, not uh, ritual. It is uh, a set of techniques that are that work, that have been worked out over millennia, and that make it possible, perhaps not for everyone, to explore these areas, but for people of predilection. And there is also a method of noticing people of predilection and then taking them through it. But I agree with you. It's, I feel very lucky because I've weathered some terrific uh, 
storms and capsizings out there on the dark ocean of mind. But I always make the metaphor that how many of us, how many people, if they didn't know how to sail, could learn to sail if they came upon a sailboat just drawn up on the sand? And that's the challenge. And a great deal, obviously a great deal of the success of any person in that situation would depend on the weather. And the weather is uh, something one must be able to intuit. If the sea is calm, you have a fair chance of mastering the rudiments of sailing before your metal is tested in any situation. If the weather is not calm, there's great danger. And I feel very lucky. And if you, any of you who have read uh, The Invisible Landscape know that we put in some fairly tough times in the Amazon. There were there was an instance of an irreversible monoamine oxidase inhibition episode which lasted 22 days. And had we not been in the Amazon basin, completely unreachable by uh, modern healthcare delivery systems, <laughs> uh, it would have fared far different for us. Fortunately, we were able to go through the entire thing. And we are trepidatious. <laughs> I mean, I am not an abuser of anything, let me tell you. I, I take these things as often as I can, but nevertheless, fairly occasionally, several times a year, and I always approach it with, uh, with fear and trembling. And uh, it's been very good to us. I mean, I have two amazing children and a lovely wife and... My head is full of ideas, my house is full of books, uh, it's been very good to us. And uh, I've uh, something perhaps oblique to what you said, but when I had the dialogue with it about uh, why us, and it said because you never followed any teachers, it also said something else, which I don't, I'm not sure I can say this without sounding hubristic, but I don't mean it that way. We also said, why us? And it said, because you are good. And when we were flirting with the flying saucer and trying to, also the Philosopher's Stone, trying to coax it out of the matrix, there would be these heated discussions between my brother and myself and the other people on the expedition. Why should we do this? Isn't this going to be like atomic energy or anything else? Isn't it going to be used by people for to coerce other people and to gain control over them? And on this point, the Logos was very insistent. And it said, you are not to worry about that. This belongs to the just and no one can lay a finger on it unless their heart is pure. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You said something about predilections, you could recognize the predilection for being able to do this. Well, I, in classical, in societies where shamanism is a going institution, the predilections are fairly uh, uh, easy to state. Uh, oddness, uniqueness in an individual. Uh, epilepsy is often a signature in uh, preliterate societies, or surviving an unusual ordeal in an unexpected way. For instance, people who are struck by lightning and live are thought to make marvelous shaman. <laughs> and uh, people who often, uh, people who nearly die of a disease and fight their way back after weeks and weeks in an indeterminate zone, they are thought to have, it's about strength of soul. And so there must be some sign of strength of soul or of hypersensitivity to these places. In traveling around the world and dealing with shaman, what I find as the distinguishing characteristic 
is uh, an extraordinary centeredness and also invariably the shaman is an intellectual. He is also invariably uh, alienated from his own society. So when you go into these Amazon villages and you're surrounded by tittering women with babes at each breast and all that and all the people just think you're very odd with all your gear huge sweating pouring pheromones into their <laughs> living space and they just think of you as people from outer space the shaman sees exactly who you are and he says oh here's somebody to have a conversation with these people are into the same thing and whenever you gain the confidence of a shaman the anthropological literature always presents them as embedded in a tradition and uh, you know, the whole sociological reductionist rap about shaman. But when you get to know them, they are always very sophisticated about what they are doing. They are the true phenomenologists of this world because they know that it's a drug and they call these energy fields spirits. But we hear the word through a series of narrowing declensions of meaning that... Uh, are worse almost than not understanding. They are speaking of spirit the way Ahmet might speak of charm. <laughs> you know? It's a, it's a technical gloss for a very complicated concept. And uh, I'm sure in all of us there are varying and greater and lesser degrees of shamanic predilection. One of the ideas that my brother and I have tossed around is uh, there are families, shamanic families, and since by our analysis of what's going on, we are, in other words, strictly speaking, hallucinogen shaman. I haven't talked at all about shamanism without hallucinogens. The hallucinogenic shamanic family lines are obviously have a basis in the genome. In other words, it's all about how many of these sites of activity, how well your serotonin, all how these things work together so that you may have these experiences. Some people claim to have these experiences on the natch. I am a very difficult person to move off the baseline of consciousness. And I scoured India and I have sat at a number of people's feet, although perhaps my attitude was wrong, because what it comes down to for me is, uh, what can you show me? And I always ask that question, and finally in the Amazon, the people said, well, let's just get our machete and hike out here a half a mile, we'll get some of this stuff and boil it up, and uh, I'll show you what I can show you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh -huh. I'd like to know what happens to us epileptic. You know, it's nice to be told we're special, but what is it? What, what, where is it in the brain that we can do something with it? You mean do something to manage it or do something to take it advantage so of much, it? You know, it hurts so much when I have it. And sometimes it's like a, a, such energy that people close to me cannot stand it, you know, cannot... St well... There are many things to be said about this. First of all, you have to realize a person in these preliterate shamanic societies that I'm talking about who had serious epilepsy would probably not make it. In other words, uh, drug intervention, I am assuming, I'm no expert on epilepsy, drug intervention is necessary in serious cases of grand mal epilepsy because nothing else is known to do for it. People die in these societies that I'm talking about all the time for all kinds of reasons. Death is really uh, uh, much more among them than it is in our society. Those who have epilepsy, who don't die, are brought to the attention of the shaman and trained in breathing and drugs and other things. And the fact is we don't really know all of what goes on. These secret information systems have not been well studied. Uh, 
then the person performs this function. But shamanism is not, in these traditional societies, a terribly pleasant office. You are not normally allowed to have any political power because you're sacred. You always sit at the head man's side in the council meetings, but after the council meeting, your hut is at the edge of the village. You are peripheral to society's goings on in every sense of the word, and you are only called on uh, in crisis. And the crisis can be someone is dying or ill, uh, there's a, a psychological difficulty, a marital quarrel, or someone has stolen something, uh, or weather must be predicted, and uh, you perform these functions. The, we are not that society. So when I explore these drugs and when I try to call their attention to, uh, call people's attention to them, it is as a phenomenon, uh, I don't know what we can do with it. I have a feeling that we can do a great deal with it, but the, s the mindset that I always take to it is simply exploratory, Baconian, mapping and gathering facts. Uh, I have migraines. M uh, there's one school of thought on migraines which holds that these are slow epileptic releases. Mm -hmm. There are similarities between epilepsy and migraine. Uh, and so speaking from migraine, there is uh, what are called scatomata, which are traveling hallucinations of scintillating light that move across your field of vision. An intense physical pain accompanies these things. And people have... Uh, extracted information from the state, used it. The 13th century mystic Hildegard von Bingen is known for a series of prayers and paintings, very odd paintings, that it now has been pretty conclusively shown. She was a mystic, that's obvious from what she said, but she must have been experiencing migrainous scotomata to do these paintings in the way that she did. I can't, I don't have any answer for you. All I can say is, uh, quote Herbert Gunther, who talks about human uniqueness and says you must come to terms with your uniqueness. A lot of the talk that has gone on in this conference has been, as I said before, about general model building that seemed to me terrifically naive about the role of language and being as the primary fact of experience. In other words, what good is a theory of how the universe works if it's a series of tensor equations that even when you understand them perfectly, nowhere come tangential to your experience? It's like you're creating an explanation for whom? For God? So that God can know how it works? <laughs> it is uh, the, uh, the only intellectual or noetic or spiritual path worth following seems to me the one that uh, builds on your own experience. And so you are given, you know, a unique situation, a challenge, epilepsy, an opportunity and a challenge. For someone else it could be a high IQ or uh, these very subtle and unstudied predilections for various drugs or susceptibility to pheromonal exchange by having very sensitive pheromonal receptors. Uh, there are psychiatrists who claim to be able to diagnose schizophrenia by smell, and that's an extreme case. But what I'm saying is you must come to terms with your uniqueness, and uh, that is all you can do, really. Yes. You have described all of these experiences as coming from the plants which are of the earth. And you have described all of these experiences as extraterrestrial, and I don't know what you mean by extraterrestrial. Okay, here's what I mean. Uh, the plants. A fungus is not a plant. Fungi are uh, a third kingdom in nature. Fungi require oxygen just like we do, and respire carbon dioxide. 
It is as though they are an amorphous animal. Uh, and they've always been lumped in with the plants. It was said it's a primitive plant. And, but once the genetics was looked at closely and the metabolism was looked at closely, it's a third category. The information that comes from ayahuasca, which is made from the vine, the Banisteriopsis copy, which is uh, a higher plant, is earth-centered and healing largely. In, and uh, seems to be about the envelopes of information that surround the earth and our bodies and the jungle, and that sort of thing. What the mushroom says about itself is that it is an extraterrestrial organism, that spores can survive the conditions of extraterrestrial space. They are black, deep, deep purple, the color that they would have to be to absorb in the deep UV end of the spectrum. Uh, the casing of a spore is one of the hardest substances, uh, organ it is the hardest organic substance known. Uh. The density it is similar to that of a metal, the density of electrons in the surface of that okay, thing. Terry, are you saying that the mushrooms never evolved on Earth? And the, what do you mean extraterrestrial in the material that's sense? What I'm, that's like what I'm. That's what the sports? mushroom said. I am mm -hmm. not sure. And global currents form on the outside of the spore, and it is very light. And by Brownian motion, these things percolate to the edge of a planet's atmosphere, and then. Uh, through interaction with energetic particles coming in from space. You understand I'm talking now about an evolutionary strategy where only one in a ten high twelve spores actually makes the transition across the stars. But it's a, it's a biological strategy for radiating throughout the galaxy without a technology. It just takes a billion or so years and wherever, but it's the same principle by which a plant migrates into a desert. Now your theory sounds very similar to Fred Hoyle and Chandra Bikram Singh. I was exactly that very theory happy for all that they <laughs> came along with that theory. In fact, that, theory is, <laughs> that theory is that all of us came that way uh, because they found it's very interesting because the um, there are uh, yeah we are comets, but that's only one vehicle. The interesting thing is that they are much more nebulae than their life-supporting planets. And Nebuli had the just the perfect environment, uh, nourishment-wise, for not the macromolecules that Frank talks about, but the pre-macromolecules. That they, are, they too are compounds, but simple compounds, which can then go to a planet and start really, really doing their thing. And they think that this is what, uh, what started all of us. And there is nothing, uh, nobody can come up against this with anything except the inertia of their opinions. The facts are very nebulous. In other words, uh, there are no fungi in the fossil record older than 60 million years. And the orthodox explanation of that is that they are soft-bodied and just didn't occur. But on the other hand, we have soft-bodied worms and things from the bottom of oceans in the sure. Flintstone chert that weigh in at just over a billion years old. So I don't believe what the mushroom tells me. We have a dialogue. It is a very strange person and has many bizarre opinions. And I entertain it the way I would rib this guy or somebody <laughs> else and say, well, so that's that's what you think, eh? And, uh, but, uh, and, and I often felt, you know, that I had the dilemma uh, when the mushroom started saying it was an extraterrestrial, I felt that I was in the dilemma of a child who destroys a radio to see if there are little people inside. I couldn't figure out whether uh, the mushroom is the alien or the mushroom is some kind of technological artifact allowing me to hear the alien and the alien is actually light years away in Bell and some kind of Bell non-locality system is exactly. allowing it C to come through. Can I through. elaborate that a little bit? Would you agree with this statement? Mushroom is a conscious being. Absolutely. However, the consciousness is not released, you know, this is a latent virtual kind of consciousness. It's not released until we be become directly connected to it in a state of the brain where we are into the unit of consciousness. That's what it says. It says, I require the nervous system of a mammal. Do you have one handy? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Should we go to lunch? Great. Thank you very much.